Well, thank you very much, Dr. Cooper, for uh, joining us this afternoon. How would you characterize uh, her um, to anyone that doesn't know who we're talking about? Well, let's put it this way. She defended the most political prisoners in our country's history. She had, and I'm reliably informed, at least 5,000 individual cases that her practice managed from the mid-70s into the early 90s. She was a fearless defender of her accused's rights. She stood up uh, on her own when others were uh, really afraid of the apartheid system. And she, for instance, uh, stood by Solomon Matlangu until that morning when he was hanged uh, in, in Pretoria prison. So she has been a major figure in our political history, particularly the fight against apartheid. And she has played uh, many other roles that you have uh, already alluded to, uh, including being ambassador to The Hague and uh, to Ireland. Um, and she is remembered by political uh, people across sectarian lines, from the Black Consciousness Movement through the PAC to the ANC. She defended them all and many of them are devastated. I mean, from last night, the tributes pouring in from individuals across the country, there are literally hundreds of them who are around and who can say without fear of contradiction that she was their friend, their confidant, their messenger. She did everything for them and she held nothing back in terms of defending those cases that she took on. You describe somebody who sounds like she was more than just a lawyer and at a time uh, when it was even difficult uh, to enter into townships, she was right there and young people were very close uh, to her at the time. You mentioned her defending uh, Solomon Matlangu at the time. What did that case mean for her? Well, from... You know, every time we met and we talked about that period, she would talk about uh, what happened with the, uh, the interventions they did. And ultimately, uh, she was at the home when uh, the hanging took place. She was very, very close to the family. Uh, she was a beacon of strength to them. And she'll go down in the annals of our history for uh, helping and take out the messages that each of the, those political prisoners, including Mahlangu, had for the country. There isn't anybody who can match Priscilla Jana. She was uh, literally larger than life. She was a great host, quick to laugh, but also quick to take exception. Uh, to the apartheid security police. She stood up as a, as a woman, as a black woman. She stood up against their might and succeeded. She was banned. Uh, and despite the banning and restriction to Johannesburg, she continued uh, defending uh, countless political prisoners in this country, countless uh, detainees, uh, countless persons who, whose families still look for the truth about their disappearance, their loss. And that, I think, is a part of our history that is not reckoned with and may have contributed uh, largely to the rage and anger we see out there. That period post the TRC, when many, many families have not received answers, they see the perpetrators go scot-free, they see the perpetrators being defended with our tax money, and yet they have to come up with their own resources to build a case against the, those perpetrators. A shameful history which, unfortunately, our democratic government has just put under the carpet. You talk about the unfinished business of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the fact that some families have to use their own resources in order to pursue and hopefully get uh, justice. She represented at the time detainees for free. She also offered support to their families. When you reflected on the unfinished business of 
the TRC. What did she tell you? Well, she, look, the, I think all of us agree politically we needed uh, the kind of rapprochement we had. However, just the findings of no one had to be held responsible, um, rather than saying somebody was responsible but nobody has come forward, I think is a blot on that uh, uh, important history of the TRC findings. And furthermore, the post period, and she always commented on the fact that cases were not pursued until fairly recently with Imtiaz Kaji pursuing doggedly the case of Ahmed Timol and bringing to court other cases, and there are a few others in the pipeline. I think that we have failed those who suffered with their lives to protect this country, to create this democracy that we so much take for granted. And she was disappointed by that. I know at the time that she was being interviewed for the Human Rights Commission, she was in two minds about it. She asked many people. And all of us said, well, Pris, you should, because if you don't, who else do we have who will carry that flag for victim rights the way you've done in the 70s through to the 90s? And that is her abiding legacy to our country. You touch on her legacy and many people, um, we just think of the recent passing uh, away of many anti-apartheid uh, struggle stalwarts uh, in the legal fraternity who gave up so much to make sure that people at least see justice. In a country like ours where there's so much unfinished business and there's so much inequality and the bones of the past uh, still rise up sometimes to haunt us, if not most of the time, what does it say about where we are headed uh, in terms of what we can take from those who came before and finishing off uh, what it is that they were unable, not because they did not want to, but what they were unable to finish? Well, look, let's just talk about the money side. I mean, many people uh, have been written about and what they sacrificed. But I think if you look at what they left, they left good legacies for their families. That will not be the case for Priscilla Jana. She will not leave a huge legacy in terms of money and property to her daughter, Tina. Uh, she, she was struggling. I mean, she did what she did and was very generous to a fault. Whatever money she made as a parliamentarian, as an ambassador, she shared with many of us. And notably, in the 70s and especially in the 80s, she helped guerrillas, she helped MK, she helped other uh, uh, sections of the liberation movement. She gave money to them. And very, very importantly, she had a direct line, or at least Oliver Tambo had a direct line to her to say, please deal with this or deal with that. And she details that in her book, which the apartheid state was never able to truly get under, because she was quite smart about how she did it. And even though under constant watch, under constant surveillance, she managed to evade uh, their uh, scrutiny. Very few have suffered in the way that Priscilla Jana has suffered. And I'm saying that knowing the lawyers who defended us, knowing many of them are, you know, they're fairly uh, comfortable, but Priscilla wasn't. Uh, when she was appointed to the Human Rights uh, uh, Commission and became deputy chair, she had to leave the comfort of her home in Cape Town and come up to Johannesburg. It was uh, an unsettling period for her, but she didn't have the kind of wherewithal to buy a palatial house and get the kinds of uh, people to help her that others have had. So in a true sense, she was part of the struggle. She identified totally with the liberation movement without question. She identified with what her clients did. She did not challenge, like some lawyers would, uh, what they accused said to them. She would attempt to put it in the best way forward. And to that end, she employed scores of advocates. And those advocates have made names for themselves. Some are judges. And they did well through what uh, Priscilla Jana 
uh, brief them on. And I think we need more people who are able to sacrifice self and their own needs for the rest of us, because this is a country that requires people to create a coherence, to create a cohesion, bring people together rather than divide them in the terrible way that we're seeing all around us. Priscilla was such a person. Dr. Saths Cooper, reflecting on the life and time of Ms. Priscilla Jana. Thank you.